Hello, I'm Wolfgang Lutz. I'm the leader of the World Population Program at IASA and founding director of the Wittgenstein Center for Demography and Global Human Capital. At IASA, we are looking at global change, at global sustainable development, and try to look in a comprehensive and holistic way at all the different factors that matter. And we in the population program particularly focus on the human beings, because human beings are at the center of sustainable development. It is their well-being today, tomorrow and in the future that matters. And for this we have brought together a group of outstanding international experts on different dimensions of sustainable development to share their knowledge and jointly produce an input to the preparations of the Rio Plus 20 Earth Summit on Sustainable Development in Rio de Janeiro next June. The major issue facing us is the population by mid-century is going to be, let's say, nine and a half billion. If we could see ways of improving female education, female empowerment, availability of contraceptives around the world, it may be perhaps even a billion lower than that. I think that's quite possible. But super, so we're talking about eight and a half to nine and yes. a half billion. We must, mustn't forget it's a sort of one billion yes. to play for. Whereas in terms of population resources, in terms of providing food, energy, water for that population, in terms of managing our ecosystem services, we're, we're facing exponential growth on our economy. So that exponential growth superimposed on this eight and a half, nine and a half billion is what really matters. Yes. Now, that means that we have to take this idea of population and how it ex expands consumption through this exponential growth into our discussions with those countries. For countries that have been very good at implementing policies, take a country like Kenya, yeah. a country like Ghana, yeah. they have done well with uh, implementing their population policies and they have had very good results. For other countries, notably like my country, Nigeria, as has a very good explicit population policy, that policy has merely remained what it is, a piece of paper yeah. tucked away on somebody's shelf and not being implemented. Fertility decline is yes. uh, plummeting very severely in, in um, countries like Singapore, Japan, uh, South Korea, uh, even Thailand. I mean, yes. um, definitely experiencing uh, unprecedented fertility decline. Uh, and that has led to much higher elderly dependency ratios. So apart from Japan, that's uh, fairly sort of close to immigration, most of the other countries have uh, ex were, uh, responding to this uh, fertility decline uh, and uh, then the care crisis basically, in terms of who's going to be looking after the elderly, uh, who's going to be looking after the children, through um, basically importing um, domestic workers, care workers, nurses uh, from neighboring Southeast Asian countries. I see. So that's been an uh, important uh, development in, um, in, in Southeast Asia in particular. Now typically we use indicators like GDP per capita. Yes. Per capita, remember. Yes. We want to yes. include population. Yes, everyone is used to reading about that. Indeed. Now the weakness of uh, GDP is, uh, there are many, but the uh, predominant uh, weakness lies in the fact that it doesn't, is not forward-looking. It doesn't include the depreciation of capital assets that accompanies the production and consumption mm -hmm. activities that we're engaged in. So you could have um, GDP increasing even while human capital declines, even while natural capital declines. And this happens. And, it, and we have yeah. data on that too. So GDP is a flow. Wealth is a stock, yes. and it's extremely important to recognize the difference. Flow measures are not going to give you any indication of what lies ahead. Yes, important so, distinction. And stocks are by definition telling you about what lies ahead mm -hmm. because stocks are embodied services, yes. embodied services, a flow mm -hmm. of services mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. the future. And of course, there is a sense in which uh, human capital depreciates uh, I don't mean in the sense of old people forgetting things, <laughs> but I mean you don't take your human capital 
you take your human capital with you when you die. Yeah. So there yes. is that. But nevertheless, during the period you are active, to the extent you have human capital, education and health, you're both enjoying life, reading poetry, for example, the ability yes, to be able yes. to do that, but plus, of course, contributing in an enhanced way to, to societal well-being. Migration is uh, not just increasing in terms of volume, but also showing very interesting trends. So many women uh, in countries in Southeast Asia are now seeking labour opportunities abroad uh, to better their own life opportunities. So that has uh, major consequences because, of course, um, it's uh, quite a change from uh, having mom and the wife being yes. the, the breadwinner of the family. And um, one of the projects I, I've been working on looks at sort of the well-being of the children who are left behind in Southeast Asian countries like the Philippines, Indonesia, Vietnam, uh, Thailand. Uh, and in the Philippines and Indonesia in particular, I mean, um, the uh, deployment of women abroad, uh, that has already sort of reached the 50% mark. Current trends in migration means that the region as a whole is uh, increasing its capacity to cope with and get used to mm. the idea of uh, people having mobility and sort of um, fulfilling their, their, their aspirations uh, beyond just national borders. We tend to use the word capital for anything which is durable. Uh, uh, and durable goods provide a flow of services. The most abstract of these capital assets are institutions and perhaps knowledge. This is, uh, by knowledge I mean now disembodied uh, yes. human capital. Yes. Uh, the general uh, culture that pervades our social environment, which we make use of. In the last 20, 30 years, we've developed techniques in economics to estimate the enhancement of what we call human capital, which includes health and education. Uh, and you need human capital in the sense of uh, personalized, embodied uh, uh, education to be able to exploit that yes. general knowledge. Yes. I mean, yes. unless you can do mathematics, the differential calculus is of not much use, <laughs> but the differential exactly. calculus is there. Yes. It's Most countries in sub-Saharan Africa do have explicit population policies, you know, to mainly lower the growth rate. There is maybe as an exceptional one or two countries that have reported to uh, the policy monitoring part of the uh, population uh, department of the UN that they would like uh, an increase in growth. But most countries have always reported back that they want a decrease in growth. And as I said, there are out there many explicit uh, population policies. The first thing is that population itself is a very difficult word to deal with in the political sphere. Yes. When we're talking amongst other northern nations, I would say the problems evaporate because we have similar problems, the demography is such that we have aging populations. We all know what the consequences are and what government actions need to be, and that's a discussion that is relatively easily had. What is much more difficult is when southern nations are at yeah. the table and the sensitivity is you're going to be telling us what to do, you guys are preaching yes, at yes, us, yes. you are the ones who've had your population explosion, yeah. you have been consuming the resources of the planet and now you want to tell us to restrict all of that. The, the best way to handle this in my view is to see that we've got southern-southern discussions taking place. Because there's no doubt it's in the best interests of each country to examine its yes. demographic situation. What are the most important components of an effective population policy? The first and most important, of course, is the political will. The government role is very important in a country where most of the people are poor. Yes. Apart from labour migration, another important element is actually marriage migration, and that's oh, on the rise right. in Asia. Um, we now have um, Vietnamese women who are, um, well, and Thai women, Filipino women, uh, Indonesian women uh, who have migrated as wives to countries, again, with a rather low uh, fertility decline and a uh, high fertility decline and delayed marriages like Taiwan, Singapore, Malaysia, uh, South Korea. And uh, what that means is 
this kind of migration basically changes the whole tenor of yes. the family. Yes. So um, remarkable. Yeah. So in that sense, um, the positive side would be that I think the region as a whole would be uh, more prepared for a much more uh, mobile world uh, in the future, where there are many more interactions across borders, and that kind of tolerance will hopefully grow from within the family outwards. Usually when we think of wealth, we think of reproducible capital assets, yes. uh, buildings, machinery, equipment, roads, ports, and so forth. More recently, we have realized that human capability is enhanced if wealth increases, but once you recognize that wealth is not only consists of uh, reproducible capital, but also human capital, mm -hmm institutions, and for a society, of course, natural capital. All that stuff out there which is producing yes. goods and services which we in turn consume or use it for producing other things. So by comprehensive wealth, it's to indicate that we are now thinking of capital assets of all forms, all durable forms of goods and services which make life worth living.